I am Dr. Anthony Chang. I'm the Chief Intelligence and Chief Innovation Officer at Children's Hospital of Orange County, and you are watching Facets TV. Welcome to Facets Television. We have an exciting evening today, and with us today is Dr. Anthony Chang. He is the Chief Intelligence and Innovation Officer at Chalk Hospital here in Orange County. And by the way, he graduated from Johns Hopkins with his BA, Georgetown with his MD, and very recently Stanford for his Master's in Data Science. Thank you so much for coming in to talk to us today. Thank you, Kevin, for very having me. Very much appreciate it. So, um, as you know, I met you by watching a, an amazing presentation on some of the things that you have going on in business intelligence and big data in healthcare. So, as you founded a program called MI3, am I right about that? That's correct. So, why don't you give us a little bit of information on what MI3 is, and then we can get into what I saw when I was there that day. Okay. Well, um, thanks to a generous grant from a member of the Walt well, Disney family here in Orange County, uh, gave me the resources needed to fulfill a vision to start a program to focus on two things. One is innovation in pediatric medicine, mm -hmm. and the second thing is artificial intelligence in healthcare. So you're a pediatric cardiologist, am I right about that? Correct. So, so your focus, of course, has been children for a very long time? Correct, in, in the for 30 years or so. 30 years. So as an innovation or an innovator in that, what is your big target to be in the use of BI? Or, and those that BI is business intelligence or big data or analytics of large amounts of data to come to conclusions. So what are you planning to do or what are you trying to do with big data? Well, I think it's a very, very exciting time in medicine because of the, um, some of the advances in artificial intelligence mm -hmm. and uh, especially recently in deep learning, which is a, a very fancy way of saying using computers and machine learning to mimic the brain. So I think it's an exciting time for medicine because if you think about how doctors practice medicine, we learn from courses, we read publications, and uh, that entails what we call evidence-based medicine. Mm -hmm. So if you think of a big iceberg, and um, what the tip of the iceberg is is probably what we call evidence-based medicine. Mm -hmm. But what's really underneath the tip of the iceberg, or 90% or so of the iceberg, is really what I like to call uh, the potential for intelligence based medicine. So intelligence based medicine means that we're going to be using all the artificial intelligence techniques that are now available mm -hmm. like cognitive computing and you heard about that mm -hmm. with IBM's supercomputer called Watson that mm -hmm. be the human contestants on Jeopardy. Right. Uh, we're going to be using deep learning um, and that was responsible for beating a human champion recently uh, in the game Go, uh, Asian game Go which is very very hard to do for supercomputer even. Because so, it takes the human, uh, human intellect and intuition and some of those things, right? Exactly. It's, um, the number of configurations possible with the game Go is um, 1 times 10 to the 170, mm -hmm. which is more than atoms in the universe. So a wow. supercomputer is able to use what it's learned from human uh, players mm -hmm. to play a human champion and handily beat the human champion. Well, what I was excited about when I watched your presentation was that, you know, I'm a, a, a computer person myself. I'm a security okay. expert and I run network systems. And, and when I'm sitting there, I'm thinking to myself, wow, the practice of medicine is actually starting to move towards the science of medicine for the first time in my lifetime anyway. Correct. Where you guys are going to actually be able to take data from multiple doctors and instead of having the memory or experience of that one doctor make right. a decision, right. it's going to be all these doctors, right? right. Is that right. not where you're moving? That's exactly. Uh, so right now when you see a doctor, um, you're basically benefiting from that single doctor's experience and education. Mm -hmm. And if you're lucky, that doctor's kept up with all the current literature. So mm -hmm. what I'm proposing is to change the paradigm in medicine mm -hmm. so that we have instantly available information and knowledge from hundreds of hospitals, uh, thousands if not hundreds of thousands of physicians, mm -hmm. their experience, plus all the electronic medical record from all the patients' data mm -hmm. that oftentimes the doctors don't really delve into, and combine all of that into a massive amount of knowledge and information, and that's sort of what I call 
using artificial intelligence in medicine really for the first time in medicine. As you may or may not know, a couple of winters have come by mm -hmm. with artificial intelligence sort of held some promise but didn't deliver. Right. But I think this time it's, it's the real deal and it's going to happen in a big way. I find it to be amazing that under the American Re Recovery and Reinvestment Act when President Obama came in, one of the things he did was pass something called High Tech, which is the Health Information for Economic and Clinical Health Act. And as a result of that, they required these electronic health records. And one of the ancillary things that's happening out of that is yeah. we're getting this amazing amount yeah. of data from all these places. Now, what are we going to be doing to, to get them to actually share that data yeah. across companies and across insurance companies and so on and so forth? So that's a great question, Kevin. So I, th I always say for all the data and computer science to, take, uh, to make benefit of the availability of data, it's going to take human beings to come together first. Right. And that's one of the things we're trying to do, at least in the pediatric world, mm -hmm. is we're unifying all the hospitals. And uh, there's an organization that we're starting called the International Society for Pediatric Innovation, or iSpy. And that's going to galvanize the, we have about 50 of some members already, trying to galvanize all of the hospitals so that we can share data. So once we have a pathway to share all of the data, then that's the exciting time. That's, yeah, that's going to be using all the techniques to mine the data and make sense of the data. I like to compare it to the difference between the days of uh, Encyclopedia Britannica, for those of you that are too young to remember that, where you had to actually go to a book and you might get one paragraph, whereas today you just type a Boolean search in Google and you get the world of information. Right. What's better about this is it's not only grabbing that information, but then it's going to build analytics on top of it, right? Correct. It's going to make decisions. Correct. If you can imagine in the medical world, there are millions of articles published on all the different diseases and diagnoses and therapies. Mm -hmm. So for me, that's again, the tip of the iceberg or the evidence-based medicine. So what's underneath the surface is everyone's electronic medical record, um, all the doctor's knowledge that's not published. So there's a lot of information that's being lost because it's not published. Yeah. So once we get to the bottom of the iceberg, that's gonna be a tremendous game for medicine. And, sort of a nice uh, period uh, in terms of using artificial intelligence in medicine because it's being used in so many other sectors in life. Mm -hmm. It's used in finance, business, even in sports. Yeah. So it's time that yeah. we grab and embrace artificial intelligence in medicine. I think it's far more important to that point too from the value of the impact on, on the human existence, health is the biggest thing, right? Right, and, right. And I've found many times, and even going to my own doctor, I hate to say it, but I'm a self-diagnoser. I often will walk in having yep. done a month's worth of research and go, it's one of these three things. I know yep. it, right? <laughs> right. And it, so, it's humbling for a physician to realize that sometimes we're not going to be right. Yeah. Despite being a seasoned pediatric cardiologist, mm -hmm. um, I now sometimes rely on patients to, who have already looked things up, like side effects for a medication that may not remember, yep. and then educate me. So I think the days of a doctor being very paternal and being the source of all knowledge is, is um, I'm happy to say, is going to end. And then we're going to start seeing um, the doctors and patients becoming partners, but more importantly, sharing all the data uh, for the decades to come in medicine. It's going to well, be- That's incredibly exciting. Yeah, it's going to be the most exciting uh, two or three decades in medicine that's going to come. Yeah, and luckily I'll, I'll get to live hopefully long <laughs> yeah. enough to see that, right? And hopefully benefit. Yeah, also. no kidding. Yeah. Well, you know, um, so why don't you tell me a little bit about what MI3 is about in the big picture? Because when I went there, there were a lot of very young people there, yeah. uh, interns and doctors, and we're all having this conversation. Can I give the audience a little bit of an idea of what MI3 sure. is about? Well, we focus on two areas, as I mentioned. Uh, one is innovation. Mm -hmm. So we try to promote innovation and people coming together and sharing ideas, sort of the um, after some of the Paris salons and Italian uh, Renaissance period with different people from different trades uh, and areas of expertise come together and share ideas and maybe come up with a better idea. So one common saying is um, everyone in the room is always smarter than the smartest person in the room. Right. So it's very exciting to see also a lot of non-clinical people coming together from venture capital, from industry, mm -hmm. from the computer science world and we share ideas about innovation and then we also share ideas about artificial intelligence and data. So there's two halves to the institute. But interesting, the, the further along I get knowing the institute and trying to develop the institute, the more I realize that two are actually beautifully intertwined. Yeah. So you can't do innovation without now data science and artificial intelligence, and you can't do the latter 
with no creative thinking. Yeah, yeah, and I think that's one of the things we need to continue to try to get through to our young people mm -hmm. more is to try to let them be innovative thinkers and not be so clinical. I Correct. That would be the way to put yep. it because we need that innovative thinking. Yes. But I do believe the big data access and some of the triggering that will come for that will, will be very good for that point, which is to help people be innovative. Right. Um, what's your end game? What's your dream in your lifetime? What do you hope to, to, you know, you've spent a lot of time in cardiology and multiple degrees. You're now doing this innovation and intelligence work. If you had your king for a day and you could come to an end game, what would it be? I think um, my dream would be someday that we would be able to tell every single patient mm -hmm. that we have the best precise strategy for whatever illness they have. And right now we're far from that. Mm -hmm. So I sort of envision this as sort of there's now a lot of medical data, most of it's not being used, mm -hmm. sitting in the electronic record. So that's sort of like having a lot of rocket fuel around. Right. And then now the computer scientists and data scientists have built rockets because they have the knowledge and expertise in different types of artificial intelligence. Mm -hmm. So we just need to put doctors and data scientists together as astronauts, so to speak, mm -hmm. and take these rockets for our moonshots. Yeah. So a lot of moonshots ideas, as you heard about recently, is what cancer yeah. cannot happen without... Mind-blowing stuff. Right. Mind-blowing. Yeah. And I, I don't want to get to it here. It's way too deep, but wow. <laughs> yeah. I mean, seriously, wow. Yeah, basically getting rid of diseases like cancer. Mm -hmm. um, and all it takes is for anyone to walk through a children's hospital in any, any city and see the oncology ward, see the cardiac ward, mm -hmm. where there are a lot of patients that are just waiting to, to, uh, for us to solve these enigmas in medicine. So can you imagine the day when there is the ability to have an external read of a body and then do your AI and then potentially use 3D printers, for example, to recreate parts? I mean, are we going to be there someday? Do you see medicine going that far? Well, I like to quote a computer scientist, Bill Gibson, who says um, that the future is already here, just not evenly distributed. Uh -huh. So 3D printing, uh, and most doctors probably don't even know this, but 3D printing is already being used for mm -hmm. certain body parts like mm -hmm. cartilages and um, different um, organ structures, and they're working on 3D printing for the pancreas to solve the diabetic issue with insulin. Wow. So um, the future is, as I said, the, the most exciting 25 years in medicine are about to begin, and that coupled with uh, the current um, disillusionment of physicians about medicine is is going to be very interesting because 90 plus percent of physicians are very disillusioned with medicine because mm -hmm. of the burden of electronic records and paperwork, and malpractice, yeah, and long yeah, hours, sure. and getting paid less. Yeah. So we need to neutralize that with a renewed enthusiasm, particularly for the younger generation, yeah. for yeah. medicine. And the way we can do that is spend time. Uh, with the younger generation, which MI3 also sponsors. We have a summer internship program. And this year, we're proud to say we're close to 100 summer interns. So wow. 100 young people, most of them who are disillusioned with medicine because of what they're hearing, uh, is acting they, like they have a renewed interest in medicine and partly because of all the exciting developments in medicine. Right. Uh, medical malpractice reform wouldn't hurt. Yeah. <laughs> um, so so um, with, with that said, I, I one of the things that I got out of the conversation on the <coughs> artificial intelligence is the concept of machine learning, right? So in our industry and in security, we're now using software that predicts behavior based on already known behaviors. Right. And I'm assuming that you guys are going to be doing the same thing with human triggers and the information that we get from the body. Is that true? That's absolutely true. So okay. currently with all the electronic records being sort of sequestered, not being used, so that's sort of the first area that we would mind important information. Mm -hmm. And then there's what I call another data tsunami coming, which is right. all the genomic information. So it's said that in the next 10 or 20 years, every human being on the planet will have their gene sequenced because it's getting so cheap. Mm -hmm. It's now around $1,000 and it takes just a few days to get your yeah. entire genome sequenced. Whereas the first human that gene that got sequenced took about 10 years and six billion dollars so it's getting to be really really cheap so yeah. that means that information is going to be available and then the following that there's the tsunami of all the wearable technology that's available now so everyone with a chronic disease in the next few years will have some device that will 
measure glucose, measure blood pressure, measure heart rate. So there's a lot of data coming. Okay. So um, rather than being drowned in the tsunamis that are coming, it's good to picture yourself being maybe surfing the tsunami since we're in Southern California. So. So one of the benefits of Obamacare, and I frankly am not a fan, but one of the benefits was that it removed the right or the ability for insurance companies to use any genetic data to underwrite your policy. And so this is an important thing. If you're going to start doing this gene therapy and we're going to be giving up our genetic information mm -hmm. to the medical industry, it needs to be understood that it won't then be used against us in the future Correct. to charge us more for you know, because they know we're going to get a disease. Right. Right? And that's the idea. What's cool about the gene stuff, uh, from my perspective, is eventually they'll know if you have this gene, you are very likely to get this disease, and therefore we're going to do these things to prevent that, or we're ready when you're 40 or whatever the age is. And right. So uh, I think well, I'm super excited about that. Um, always a little bit of ethical dilemma with a new technology. So the dilemma is, especially if you have an incurable disease, would you want to know earlier in life that you're going to yeah. die from yep. a disease at age 30 or 40? Yeah. And sometimes, right, and sometimes the child is too young to really fully comprehend the, the ethical dilemma there. So um, there are ongoing ethical debates. On the, on the curing side, though, um, there's gene editing now that's available uh, that's particularly um, robust. So I think in the future, Diseases that we traditionally think are not curable, like Duchenne muscular dystrophy, which is a devastating neuromuscular disorder that affects a lot of children. Sure. They end up in wheelchairs and die of heart failure. Right. So we can actually cure that disease eventually. Oh, that's fantastic. Well, I really want to thank you. I hope that, that you'll come back at some point. And, Be happy and to. I can't tell you how much I enjoy thank you, talking Kevin. with you and learning thank from you. Thank you, Kevin, for having Very me. Very much. Thank you. You've been watching Facets Television, and with us tonight has been Dr. Anthony Chang. He is the Chief Intelligence and Innovation Officer with Chalk Hospital, and we hope you'll come back again, and you as well.